Good afternoon. I am Brian Breitholz, the Assistant Vice President for Alumni Relations, and on behalf of the Cleveland State University Alumni Association and the Division of Student Affairs, welcome to A Journey from the Land to ESPN, the first installment of our About Manhood series. And it's only fitting that the first eight folks in this room were women, so let's hear it for the women once again. <laughs> The roles of men and definitions of masculinity continue to evolve. It is our goal through this series to showcase alumni and friends who embrace, whose examples, excuse me, demonstrate leadership in embracing change through the lives they lead and the examples they set. Today, we are very proud to launch this series with one of our, one of our very own, Dwayne Bray. A 1988 communications graduate from CSU's College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences, Dwayne Bray grew up in the gritty streets of East Cleveland and is now a news executive for Walt Disney's ESPN. But his journey never was one big fairy tale as he will soon share. His full bio is on the program cards which are at your seats. Before we begin to hear from Dwayne, however, let's roll this video. Why do you believe you have been removed as Baylor president? Because the captain of the ship goes down. Yeah, I was like in total shock that this guy wasn't fired. I asked the Lord if my son hadn't have played football, would he still have died on that day? Oh, Father, tell me, do we get what we deserve? Oh, we get what we... What you see in this hour may change your perception of any sporting event. And where down we go, 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 go. There is little doubt that the host nation, South Africa, will be ready. We visited Russia at a critical moment in history. <laughs> Take me! Take me, leave my dad alone! Playing hockey is different than playing football, according to Gary Bettman. You've played football. What do you make of that statement? In hockey, you have the same exact thing. There is no difference. When you found out that the person Cardell killed was Will Smith, did that change anything? Everything. Somebody left a note on my daughter's locker saying, I'm glad you're gone, nigger. It's not worth it. Putting your kids out there right now is not worth it. They just come up behind me and pin me down, and then just slip off my pants. When you found out that Jordan was sodomized with a broom handle, how does that hit you as parents? Rage. When you found out that Jordan Preeby was hazed with a broom handle, why didn't you report that to the proper authorities? I didn't hear from the president. I didn't hear from the athletic director. And what was your subject line? I was raped at Baylor. She says that you had sex with her without her consent. That's, that's untrue. These players are part of our program, so I do feel responsibility. Do you believe you were dealt with fairly by Ken Starr and truthfully? Absolutely not. It's helped me out. It's totally legal. Why do those guys carry guns? Is that the cool thing to do? I saw him punching him, kicking him. I saw him hold him down so they can beat him some more. Usually the girls would come out one by one. What have NCAA investigators focused on in those meetings? The money. A lot of people want to know where the money came from. Uh, you can talk to my lawyer for any questions. I can't find one person, not one didn't do anything about it. Witnesses said it was an accident. Troy's mother is convinced it was murder. What you're about to see is the result of a year's worth of reporting, audio recordings, text messages, hospital records, and police interrogation video. No one hit that kid after he was down, dude. What happened to Troy Causey Jr. after the fall? I can make plays. I can help teams win games. And that's all that should matter. How the hell do you play NFL football if you're stoned? Well, how do you play NFL football on a handful of Vicodin? 
Did you read the article where he said there's not, I don't have a sane bone in my body? I don't know that you've done much to disprove anything he said. No comment. You get a good looking witch on here, go ahead. Parents selling kids to the highest bidder. He likes to fight dogs. How do you know that? Because I've seen it. Nothing can ever prepare you to go into a house where your family's looking at you. Say, why, why is this happening? Well, Lindsay, this was about more than just, more than just, more than just, we have a moment here with a, a political demonstration. Get all this, shoot this, shoot this, shoot this. Please join me in welcoming Dwayne Bray. <clears throat> Thank you. Can you hear me? Is this on? You can hear? Thank you. Glad to be here. Manhood. What is a man? What is a man? How do you define manhood? How is a man from the west side of Cleveland different from a man from the east side of Cleveland? How is a man who is straight different from a man who is not straight, who is gay? What does it even mean to be a man? For the next hour, we're going to talk, and we're going to deal with some of those questions. We're going to deal with the term, a real man. We're going to deal with some of the things we think, the perceptions in this society of what a man should be and what a man should not be, or what we think it is, or what you think it is. And what's funny is that I'm up here giving this speech, and how do I know what it means to be a man? How would I even know? You see, I come from what researchers call a matriarchal society. You know what that is? That's when women are generally the head of the household. So what happens when women are ahead of the household, and they're serving the role in many phases of being a man or the man of the house. Yeah. Or they have a little boy that they're raising, and you've heard women say this before, that's my little man. The story with me starts back when my mother became pregnant. She was 13 years old. City streets of Cleveland. And then I was born. And I was her trophy baby. Teenage girls having a baby. She was 14 when I was born, three weeks to her 14. And so I was her trophy baby. And I grew up. And believe it or not, I had an afro. And one of the main things she used to do is take me to the barber shop, where all the barbers used to fuss over my curly hair. But something unique happened there. Because my mother was so young, I actually remember dropping her off at high school. Can you, anybody else in this room remember dropping their mom off in the 11th grade at high school? It's very unique. That doesn't happen too often. My mother was a wonderful, sweet lady. She died a couple years ago at the age of 63. She was beautiful, and because I didn't have a father in my life, especially when she was young, she was the target of a lot of men who lived a fast life. And I got to live that fast life with her and them. We traveled the country. 
I lived in Atlanta, Georgia as a little kid, as an eight-year-old. When I got to Atlanta, Georgia, my mom went off to Miami to do who knows what. The guy she was with at, at the time, he would be home some nights, and other nights he wouldn't be home. So I was eight years old in Atlanta, Georgia, right around the time when there was a serial killer murdering young black boys. His name was Wayne Williams. Some of you will remember that. My mother struggled with a drug addiction for many, many, many years. But I can tell you, the last 20 years of her life, she was clean and sober, and she never liked the title sponsor. For some people like being a sponsor. Some people are very good at it. I'm going to tell you about a guy uh, a little later on who was very good at it. But she didn't like the title of sponsor. She had been to prison by my count. I'm an investigative reporter, but I've never run her record. She had been in prison eight times in Houston, Texas. She was in prison when I was a student here at Cleveland State, and I remember she got arrested once, and she needed bail money, and I had just got a Pell Grant. It was $500, and I needed that to go to school. I sent the $500 to Texas where she had moved so that she could make bail. And when she went to prison, I just thought it was a lost cause. She said, Dwayne, I'm going to clean up. I'm going to straighten up. I'm not going to do drugs anymore. And every time she'd come out, and she'd fall back into that same trap. I'm no expert on addiction. But the last time she did that and she said that, she kept her word. And I didn't believe it. She was clean and sober for a year. All right, so OK, sometimes she, you know, Give her, give her 18 months. Now, I'm not a believer at this point. Then she was clean and sober for two years, then five years. And then my job as a journalist moved me to Dallas, and she was in Houston. Then she started coming up and reconnecting with her grandkids, her three kids. And then she was clean and sober for 10 years, then 20 years, and she was helping people. But the hepatitis C that she had contracted from either a prison or a needle caught up with her and ended her life, just as it was starting, in my view. That was my mother. And then there was her mother, San Janela Smith from East Cleveland, Brightwood Avenue. She was only 17 when she had my mother, and since my mother was 14 when she had me, it meant my grandmother was 31 years old when I was born. I wrote a book in 99, and I think I started it off by saying she was the youngest grandmother in the world. But she took care of her family, even though she dropped out of school in 10th grade in Alabama with a Jim Crow education. Jim Crow education means there was an education for the privileged, mostly white people, and then there was an education for the black people. They didn't have good teachers. They didn't have good schoolhouses. But my grandmother came to Cleveland along with her sisters. And I have some family in the audience here, and we'll get to that. And she and her one sister in particular, Aunt Laura, they made sure we had a house. They made sure we had a place to live. Let me ask you, they were women, matriarchal society. Is that fulfilling the role that we think men should fill? And, and fulfill, and, and we know my story is just one example. I'm sure a lot of you in this room have the exact same story or close to the same story where a grandmother or aunt or some other female in your life had to fulfill that role. And then there were my mother's sisters. There was Pat, there was Marie, and there, were, there was Dorothy. Because my mother was only 14 when I was born and she was the oldest, and her sisters and brothers at that point were between the ages, I believe, 2 and 11. And then I was born. I wasn't like a nephew. I was like a brother. So it was one big dysfunctional extended family. But she had her three sisters, and they did their part to help raise me. And then she had brothers. The oldest was Bill, the next was Bobby, and the third was Anthony, who we call Aunt Mo. I don't know where we come up with these names, these nicknames. But the boys were more like my big brothers. 
Bill was around a lot, but he was older. He was older, so he was out running around with his friends a lot, and Aunt Mo was only two years older than me, and Bobby was four years older than me. So the three of us, we hung out and we were tight together. And then my mother had, my mother, her name is Queenie. Queenie had two men in her life that stick out to me. One is, you know, as she had, as she collected boyfriends over the years, and I don't mean that in a negative way, she was just, she was pretty and she liked things, so, you know, men were attracted to her. But then there was one in particular who st stood out, and he was the closest thing I ever got to a stepfather. His name was Roy. And Roy taught me a lot about being a man. For one thing, I love sports. I love sports. I used to read the, the newspapers in the morning. We, we didn't have any social media and all that. We had newspapers. You had to actually go to the store and buy one and read it. And I used to read about the Cavs, the Indians, and the Browns. And it was also theoretical. And I was so smart about sports that men in the neighborhood would come over to our house and they would knock on the door, two older men, and they would ask for Dwayne, and I would come to the door, what do you want? Hey, we're having a sports argument, and we got a bet, and we need you to solve it. See, they didn't have an internet. I was Google <laughs> at eight, nine, 10 years old. But then there was this guy named Roy. He was different than all my, my mother's other boyfriends. He wasn't like the guy down in Atlanta who would leave me at home at night. He would stay at home. He would do things with me. He would take me to the Indians game, and one day, I remember on a Memorial Day, uh, he said, hey, I was about 13, he said, you wanna go to the Indians game? And we went down there, and the Indians had this pitcher named Dennis Eckersley, and he threw a no-hitter. And I got to see the no-hitter, and we didn't have good seats, but Roy put like $5 under his cheap, we had cheap seats under his tickets, and he handed it to the usher, who took us up towards the front of the ballpark. So I get to see a no-hitter, and I'm sitting in $100 seats. That's a man, okay? That's a man. And then he would, the Cavs didn't play downtown. They played at Richfield Coliseum. We would drive out there. He took me to actual NBA games. And we went to Cleveland Browns games at the old stadium. And then there was another a man in her life, my mother's life. That was my grandfather, but he lived in Mississippi. And at a certain point, when my mother was, drug abuse was spiraling out of control, and I was kind of lost, leaving. I was going to Shaw High School in the ninth grade. My granddad, his name was Samuel Bray. They called him Fat. Again, I don't know where these middle names come, these nicknames come from. So Fat asked me if I wanted to move to Mississippi. So I moved to Mississippi to be with my grandfather fat because, you know, he wasn't rich, but he was a mason, a bricklayer. He owned a bunch of property. So I told everybody in Cleveland, I'm going to live with my rich granddaddy. And I, I made it to Mississippi, and I remember it was the Greyhound bus, and it was about 23 hours. I was 14 years old. I got off the bus. Uh, fat and my, uh, my aunt picked me up, and as soon as I got out of the house of the driveway, was in Mississippi, even though my grandfather had some money, his house was very dilapidated. He didn't believe in creature comforts. The, 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 the dirt was red. And I thought, as soon as I got out of the driveway, oh no, I want to go back to Cleveland. I don't want to be here. But, and I think this is important, I always felt a sense of loyalty to everybody. If I tell you I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. So I made up my mind right there as a 14-year-old. Before I even got out of the car and stepped on that red clay dirt, I'm, this, I was in the ninth grade. I'm gonna do one school year here. I'm not, because my grandfather wanted me there and I couldn't disappoint him by telling him, I don't wanna be here. So I stayed the whole year. I did one school year. I was a baseball player up here. Meridian High Wildcats were the best team in the state of Mississippi. 35 people from this little town of about 40,000 40, people, 35 players were either in minor leagues or major league baseball, including Dennis Oil Cam Boyd. And all of a sudden, I'm in the middle of this baseball program, and then I got cut. I got cut, and it was awful. 
But I spent about a month training with them. And after the year was over, I went back to Cleveland, and I went out for baseball at Shaw, and they put me on varsity immediately. What I learned from those country boys in one month, down there, it wasn't much, but in baseball up here, I was a star. I was a star because they work hard down there. They all say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, and, and that sort of thing. One thing my mother always did, if she, even if she wasn't the best mother in the world, she had all these books. And they were like these love stories and these novels. And she always read. So guess what I did? You model that behavior. I always read. And it led to my career. That's why I'm at ESPN now. She gave me that. You always have to see what's good inside people. You don't just see the syringes and the needles and the track marks all up her arms and down her legs. Although I will say, my 16-year-old son, when he was born and when he, she finally reconnected and he was about four, he said, Grandma, what are all those marks on your legs and arms? And she used to always tell him, I'll tell you when you get older, son. I'll tell you when you get older. Let me talk a little bit about what it means to be a man. First, men, we got it made. Because right now in America, more women graduate from college than men, yet we still make more money than women. How is that fair? Being a man also deals with the things we think it means. Power. Respect. That's what we see in our current White House. And that's the only thing I'm going to say about that, because ESPN already told me, we've been in too much trouble in the news for talking politics. Don't you go to Cleveland talking politics. All right, so I'm going to keep my job. Those were the hard traits. And I said, we see that in the current White House. The previous White House had hard traits, too. I'm not mentioning anybody's name. But some of those other traits that we saw, I think, are what I call soft traits. And this is where I think most men fall down. We don't want to be weak. We don't want to be vulnerable. But that's the only way you grow. Oh, so traits like empathy. That means you don't have to, I don't have to have sympathy for this brother right here or something. Empathy means I understand where he's coming from and I'm willing to help him. Or caregiving, right? Caring for other people. That's not just a, women's, a woman's job. Or devotion. Being devoted. Being loyal to your spouse, to your girlfriend. And, and not thinking, oh, I got to have a girlfriend, then I got to have what they call side chicks. All right? Now we're talking about being a man. And then there's and we have a diverse room here, and I only can talk about my heart and my passion and where I come from. What about being a black man? You know, you run an elevated risk sometimes just because of the color of your skin. Um, I talked about my uncles, Bobby, Aunt Mo, and Bill. So in 1987, I know I'm old, I was a student here at Cleveland State, and I had some new clothes, and Bill says to me one day, hey, where'd you get that stuff? I said, it's pretty cheap. There's a store called TJ Maxx out in Wycliffe. So he says, hey, you know, because I had a car, and he didn't. He said, look, you know, when you get some time, run me out there. I want to buy a few things. So I took him out there on one Saturday morning, and he and I were the only two black guys in the store, and there were a lot of customers. And then a third black guy walked in the store. I had never seen him, and Bill had never seen him. And I don't know what he was up to. I'm shopping, and when we got to the uh, cashier to check out, Bill says to me, I say to Bill, instead of buying me gas, there's a pair of sunglasses. I said, just buy me those, and we're even. And he bought me those, and instead of putting them in the bag, I put them on, because the sun was coming in, I put them on. And when I got outside, get up against the, get up against the window. They threw me up against the window, put my hands up. I'm like, what's the problem, officer? The store security. 
He said, those sunglasses, you stole them. I'm like, we can go talk to the cashier. I was just like laughing with her. She'll tell you we paid for them. Plus, we have the receipt. Get up against the window. Now, my Uncle Bill, who's seen a few cops in his day, he's like, no, y'all not taking them in the store. I know what y'all do to young black boys back there. And they were telling Bill to stand back. And me, knowing his record, I pull out my car keys and said, go back to East Cleveland. Take, get out of here. Because if they start running you, we're going to be in trouble. <laughs> so they take me in the back of the store, and he's, he goes, long story short, next thing I hear, Wycliffe police coming, a bunch of them. They got dogs and everything. For me and my sunglasses. That's all I had. So they take me to jail. And when I get to the jail, something miraculous happens. They take the handcuffs off. They take me to the cell. By the way, this is like, I know young kids don't know what Andy Griffith's show is. <laughs> I was their only prisoner. <laughs> so I'm in the cell, and the cop comes back there who's waiting on the inmates, me. I'm the only inmate. He goes, I've seen you somewhere before. I'm pissed at this point. I don't want to hear. I'm on my bunk. And he goes, you write the sports down at Cleveland State? Then I looked up, I said, yeah, I write for a paper called The Cauldron. He said, oh, I take classes at Cleveland State. I always read your articles on the basketball team, and I knew I had seen your picture somewhere. And he treated me like royalty until I got out of that cell two or three hours later. Long story short, I did hire a lawyer. Uh, we, we were going to file a lawsuit. They offered me $1,000 to drop it. I was like, no. They went up to three, four. They offered five. My lawyer said, dude, you spent two hours in jail. Take the five grand. <laughs> and then just one more story like that. I had gotten a job at the Los Angeles Times. I mean, I'm from East Cleveland, man. I'm a Los Angeles Times reporter. So I came home to Cleveland. And for some reason, from LA, I used to fly into Columbus. Either the flights were cheaper direct route, and I'd drive up to Cleveland. So on my way back to Columbus to get back to, to Los Angeles, I got pulled over in Medina. And you got to understand, Medina is when I left Cleveland State. That's where I had my first job. I was the first black reporter in Medina. So the troopers pulled me over, and they asked me to get out of the car. And I'm like, what for? Why, why did I get out of the car? They just said, get out of the car. Next thing you know, I don't know what it is with cops and me. Here comes the dogs again. And these are drug-sniffing dogs. And it's winter, and it's mushy. They put me in the back of the car. They handcuff me. And these dogs with their paws with all this mud on them, they go through my car looking for drugs. All they were going to find was a reporter's notebook. I, I don't sell drugs. Then they let me go with nothing else. But the car was a mess. And I had to catch this plane. And once I returned the car in Columbus, uh, I got charged like an extra $40 for a maintenance fee because of these police dogs looking for drugs when I didn't have any. So we do have, at times, a higher burden being an African-American male. Let me tell you about this guy who works with me. His name is Eddie. Eddie is a content associate at ESPN on a show that I help run called E60. Eddie is African-American. Eddie is a hell of an athlete. Four-year scholarship, University of Illinois. I think he was all Big Ten. Had a cup of coffee in the NFL, played for the Oakland Raiders. So Eddie, when his career was over, I don't know if he got injured or whatever, it was over. Eddie's still a very young man. He got a job at the lowest level of ESPN. Then he came and told me when he was just working highlights in Sports Center. He says, I want to be a storyteller, and you run all the storytelling units, and um, I want to work on E60 or Outside the Lines. Outside the Lines is what you just saw up there. And E60 is sort of our magazine, sort of sports, of 60 minutes of sports. And so this NFL player, think about that. This NFL player, he wants to work for a TV station. He doesn't have that much pride that he cannot go to the lowest level of ESPN and work his way up. Let me tell you something about the athletes I work with at ESPN. People think, they, they told me, you know, they're all going to have huge egos. 
They're all, the athletes are not the problem. I don't care if you're talking about Tim Tebow, Coach Edwards, Chauncey Billups. Athletes are easy to manage. You know why? Because they've been coached since they were little boys and little girls. They're used to following almost a paramilitary regimen. Athletes are easy. Athletes, I don't care, you can be LeBron James. You know when coach says something, that's what you do. So the reason I bring up Eddie is because I said, Eddie, I'm going to Cleveland to give this speech. You played in the NFL, you're now working a low level job at ESPN, and you're going to work your way up, and I have no doubt that Eddie McGee will be the president of ESPN someday. So I said, what does it mean to be a man? And here's what Eddie wrote. And he wrote it, and I want to read it to you. Honestly, I'm not 100% sure what it means to be a man. I'm still figuring that, that out, and that's OK. I think I've learned what it doesn't mean to be a man. Being a man doesn't mean you're hard all the time or emotionless, unless the emotion is anger. It doesn't mean you can't or don't need to rely on people for help. It doesn't mean having too much pride, you know, the stereotypes. Being a man means being human. Being able to be comfortable with who you are, what you want to be. Not what society and others dictate what a man is supposed to be. If you can sit in your bedroom alone, in the dark, just you and your higher power, and ask, do I know who I am? What do I love? Do I provide and care for others? Can I acknowledge and accept my shortcomings? Do I have the strength to strive to be a better person tomorrow than I am today? Eddie writes, then, you can call yourself a man. I'm going to shift this a little bit. And Brian, keep me honest on time. I'm going to shift this a little bit. So people often ask me, they say, well, Dwayne, your mother was 13 when she got pregnant, barely 14 when she had you, and now you're running all these shows and units at ESPN. Like, what about these other kids? Like, what, what can you say to them? What drove you? What drove you? Um, what drove me is what I call a chip on my shoulder. But I don't look at that in a negative way. I almost want to call it chip ahoy on my shoulder. OK? And we're going to talk about something a little later about anger and what you should do. But the chip on my shoulder is, I grew up here. I grew up in East Cleveland. I was not a great student, not because I couldn't be, because, but I was interested in other things. I got people here who were on the streets who were way harder than me, but I was hard enough. I was in situations where I was in the back of a police car. I was once in the back of a police car with a pocket full of drugs in my pocket, and the cop couldn't find them. And I tried with the handcuffs to put him in the police car, but I couldn't reach over. So when he got me out and they took me in, and they weren't hard drugs, it wasn't cocaine or something, they were um, um, amphetamines or whatever. But I'm not excusing that, this is who I was. So they finally patted me down and I kept saying, oh, there's nothing in this pocket. And the East Cleveland police went for it. And then they took me in a holding cell, and I finally got rid of the drugs, put them, uh, left them in the room. Uh, my granddad came and picked me up, not the one down in Mississippi, the other one. You're like, we got a lot of men in our, you know, in, in our lives and family. Came and picked me up and never saw those drugs again. I had to do some community service. But there, before the grace of God, I'm going to juvie for a year or two. And there were other incident, incident, incidents on the streets that I could tell you about. I was in all of them. Again, I'm not hard as some of my friends, but I was hard enough, and I could have gone either way. But here's the way I went. So I love the sports, and my stepdad would take me to these games, 
and I would read the columns. I'm like, I can write this stuff in the newspaper just like them, and I wanted to do it, so I did everything I could at Shaw High and at Cleveland State, and I went over to the Cleveland Plain dealer and said, all right, what, I'm covering the Browns, the Indians, what, you want me to cover City Hall? And they looked at me and they said, listen, man, let me tell you something. We can hire people who went to Syracuse, Northwestern, Missouri, Ivy Leagues, Harvard, Yale, Cornell, Stanford, Brown. Why would we want to hire you from East Cleveland and Cleveland State? I said, because they don't know this city. They don't know that the Cuyahoga River and the mayor's hair caught on fire, and I do. You got to teach them all of that. So in essence, you're telling me they're smarter because they didn't come from my neighborhood and they didn't get a degree from Cleveland State, which by the way, let's, Cleveland State is the greatest university in the world because they give everybody an opportunity. <laughs> they, wouldn't, they wouldn't hire me, they wouldn't hire me, but you know what I said? I didn't get mad at the plane dealer. I mean, I was a little mad at the plane dealer, I admit that. I'd be lying if I said, I was pissed. But I understood. See, this is, again, the days before the internet, before social media, and you, I mean, especially young people in this, in this room, your local newspaper was as big as Facebook or Instagram. It was huge, and it is what I wanted to do, but since they weren't going to let me do it, this is this chip on my shoulder. I was going to go out and work so hard that they were gonna to have to come begging for me. That was my plan, absolutely. I went to Dayton, Ohio, and what did I know? I knew the streets, but I had a degree from Cleveland State and I wanted to be a reporter. And I noticed because you see, Dayton is here, Detroit's here, Miami's here, and Atlanta's there, and there's a highway, I-75, and they call it Cocaine Lane. And when I got to Dayton, I did my job, I was a police reporter, but I was always looking for something bigger and better. I wanted to write the big story. And I'm like, Cocaine Lane and all these drug dealers from Detroit are getting off, and Dayton police had no idea what to do with it other than crack skulls. That's all they knew. But by being a reporter, I had a pass to see crack skulls firsthand because they wanted the paper to glorify them, so they, they would let me ride and jump out of the drug task force vans with them. And that was cool. But when I would jump, jump out of drug task force vans, as they rounded people up and hit them in the head and all of that, I talked to the drug dealers. I'm like, man, what's really going on around? Oh, man, you cop. I said, I'm not a cop. Well, why are you drop jumping out of the car with the cops if you're not a cop? I said, I'm a reporter. I said, I'm going to come back around here later in the day when they're all gone. So I would go back, and these guys would even point a gun to my head saying, get out of here. We don't want newspaper. But, and I told this story the last time I was here. When I was talking to them one time, and they said, we don't sell drugs around here. Get out of here. We don't want the newspaper. And the cops came up on a sweep. And they ran, and I ran. And we got away. I'm a reporter. I'm getting away from the cops. And they said, dude, when we broke, you broke. I said, I'm trying to tell you I'm from East Cleveland, dude. I'm no different than you, except I have a Cleveland State degree. That's the only difference. I could be you. They gave me that story. Uh, their, their story. They told me their story. I wrote it. Uh, it was very beneficial for me. And it was beneficial for them, too, because I think after the story, the city saw how bad this housing project was. I won't get into it. The, the way I identified that project was through something called computer, um, com computer assisted reporting where I figured out the most drug arrests in the city was happening at this one housing project, which is why I wanted to go down there. And they gave them a lot of services down there. Not the drug dealers, but the, the good people who didn't want the drug dealers around. They cleaned that up after my story. But for me, I started getting contacted by all the big newspapers in the country saying, we got drug dealers, can you come and do some of that reporting here? And I ended up in LA where they said, we got the Bloods and the Crips. And I did a lot of reporting on them. But getting back to the story, guess who called me four or five years ago when they were seeing it? It was the Cleveland Plain Deal. And they're like, dude, you want to come home? <laughs> I'm like, I'm working for the Los Angeles Times. Why would I want to come home? And I got the New York Times on the other line and the Washington Post. On, like, I'm like, you snooze, you lose. Chip on your shoulder. Don't get mad. Somebody rejects you, whoever it is. Whatever it is, just don't get mad.
Just figure out how you can work harder, how you can work smarter, and, and keep it going from there. Um, now I just want, as I think about wrapping this up, I want to give you guys some of what I call tools that can help you in your own life and own career. There's four or five things, but the first one is be a good person. That's so simple. Be a good person. All my dealings with the plane dealer, I've never tried to make them feel bad because I never know if I want to come back here and have to work, right? Be a good person. Always smile, even in your enemy and adversary's face. Be a darn good person. I call it killing them with kindness, no matter what they do to you. Another thing, don't avoid issues. I don't care if it's at home with your mother or your sister or your brother or your professor or somebody you want to work for, or your girlfriend or your boyfriend. Confront issues dead on. Because one thing I've learned is when something is bothering you, keeping you up at night, and you just let it go and you let it fester, it doesn't get any better. And it usually ends up exploding into an argument or something like that. I mean, I work at ESPN. I supervise people like Stephen A. Smith. OK? And Stephen A. and I, we're like that. But even with him, if I had to talk to him about something, I talked to him about it. Another thing, learn to think critically. I was at lunch today with uh, Dean Sedlick um, from the um, College of uh, Liberal Arts. But he, here's, the, here's the thing. We were talking about young people today, and they read stuff on their Instagram, or they read stuff on Facebook, and they don't know what's true and what's false. So you got to learn to think everything you read is not true. Is not true. But the other part of that is read, 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 read. I know people don't want to read more than 140 characters at a time anymore today, but you've got to read. I read everything I could read because you never know when you might need it. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. And if you read and you, people will put flyers on my windshield on uh, ethanol. I don't care about ethanol, but I'll read it just because I want a little knowledge of that. Last two, very important. Listen. Learn to listen. Most people don't want to listen. If you're talking to them, they're just waiting for you to finish what you can say so they can say, and you might not even hear. They may have said something like, oh, I hit, I hit the Powerball for $500 million. And you say, yeah, but you, you didn't even hear that. Listen. Listen, don't only wait for your chance to talk, because we don't listen, especially today with all these phones. Everybody's multitasking. I have meetings. I have high-ranking people who report to me, and I have to tell them, can you put the phone down? Instead of the meeting lasting an hour, maybe it lasts a half hour if you just pay attention. And these are professionals. People don't want to listen. And then the last thing on that is don't be afraid to seek help. We all need help. I need help. You need help. And the help is just letting people know occasionally what's wrong, what's keeping you awake at night. I got three quotes I want to read because these are things that I really believe in. One is, one is more nerdy, but so I'll read that one first. It's Louis Pasteur is the guy who came up with the pasteurization process is why we can drink milk that comes from the cow and all of that. And Louis said, chance favors the prepared mind. Chance favors the prepared mind. That means any chance you get in life, if you're a basketball player here and you want to go to the NBA, you got to practice. you got to be prepared for when your opportunity comes. And I know a little bit about this. I'll just digress a little bit. My, my youngest son told me, he said, uh, when he was about seven, 
I'd introduce him to all these sports, baseball, not football. Um, I said not football, <laughs> head injuries. Uh, basketball, softball. So one day I was talking to him, I was like, which, and this is Chan's favor in the prepared mind, which sport, you know, you want to play? Yeah. I said, what you want to do? He said, I'm going to play pro basketball. I said, dude, your mama 5'2 and I'm 5'9. How are we going to make this work? I said, well, let me give you four options. Door one, you just play basketball with your friends, no pressure ever. Door two, you try to be good enough to make your local travel team. Door three, you try to be good enough to play high school ball and some level of college. Door four, you try to play pro ball, whether it's the NBA or Europe. Little seven-year-old looked at me and said, door four. I said, that's the NBA. I just told you your mama 5'2". He said, that's what I want to do. I said, so here's what we got to do for door four. From right now, you got to work two hours a day in the gym. And an hour of that every day has to be skills. And by the way, I was an AAU coach at the time. So, and I had players. Uh, I was coaching the girls team. And some of those, uh, seven of them went D1. And one was a first round draft pick in WNBA. So I kind of knew what I was doing, but I'm like, do you know what you're signing up for? Because door one would have been fine to me. Just let you be a kid and play with your friends. Nope, I want to go all the way. So every day, I bought heavy balls. I bought everything you can be. And I just trained him. I was in the gym with him. Uh, he would come, like I said, these WNBA player who, who was going on to WA. He would come practice with us, go through the drills, everything you can think of. Got pretty good. So we came up with the goal. By the time you graduate from high school, I want you to, I'm going to chart it, and I want you to have 10,000 hours in the gym. Long story short, he did everything. He's very coachable. By the time he was in ninth grade, he had 10,000 hours in the gym. By the time he was in eighth grade middle school, he was starting varsity on his high school basketball team. He's going into his junior year now. Colleges are starting to look at him. He's probably the best. Uh, three-ball shooter in Connecticut and one of the top five in all of New England. But that's Chan's favorite. This kid said, I'm going to do it. This is what I want to do. And he did everything he needed to do every day. We don't know what's going to happen, but that's where he's at. I'm going to wrap this up with a few other things, and then we can take questions. Second quote. First one was Chan's favorite to prepare mind. Second one is, you end up where you're headed. Just think about that. You end up where you're headed. If you end up in the NBA, that's where you were headed. If you end up in prison, that's where you were headed. Because it's basically saying your behavior is dictating what happens to you. It's not anybody else's fault. And then last one, this is the one I said addresses anger. One of my producers said this to me a few years ago, and I always remember it. He said, whatever the situation, don't get mad, don't get even, get what you want. And I've tried to live by that because I really feel like getting mad and trying to get even, even back at the Cleveland Plain Dealer. I'm sorry, I don't mean to throw them under the bus. I got a lot of friends there. <laughs> but get what you want. Um, a couple things I want to do. Couple things I want to do here. Oh, excuse me. Flip around here. <laughs> Hi. I just bought a few things. I just want to. These are little parting gifts from ESPN. Who is? Shirt. Who's last? Wait, wait, wait. There's something else in here. First, I want to thank the people who sponsored this. Uh, I was trying to start off without just going into the to uh, thank yous 
right off the bat, but I want to uh, thank the Alumni Association here and everybody else who was part of sponsoring this. Um, I also want to introduce a few people that I mentioned. So I mentioned the guy who served as a real man to me, my stepfather, Roy Williams. Roy, can you stand up? I mean, that's the guy, as a little boy, he didn't have to do that. He took me to those games. He, what we call, whetted my appetite for sports, for journalism, and I give him a lot of credit. I also talked about my mother's brothers, and I talked about the older one who was with me at TJ Maxx. That's my Uncle Bill. Uncle Bill, can you? And lastly, um, oh, my girlfriend, she's going to work. I need to mention her. Topaz people, it's my girlfriend. She keeps me balanced. But I also just want to thank all of you for giving me the opportunity. And, you know, I feel like the room was engaged. I, I feel like you listened. I feel like there's a lot of potential in here. And I'm up here today, but all of you have the potential to far exceed anything I've done and to tell your own story. And I just hope you took one or two things out of this. I also have some business cards that I'll put on the table, so if anybody wants to reach out to me, ask me about ESPN, life, streets of East Cleveland, I'm open to any and all of that. So we're gonna take some questions, but let me say thank you before we do that. We have a few minutes for a few questions. Anyone have a question? Hi, I'm Brad Sutton. Um, I'm from Connecticut, New Haven, Connecticut, actually. And I just wanted to ask you your experience being in the state and you know working at ESPN and how the transition from Cleveland to Connecticut has been. Um, if I had my choice of where to live, believe it or not, it would be here in Cleveland, Ohio, because that's where my heart is at and all of that. Um, Connecticut is, I think the second richest state in the nation. I hate their taxes. <laughs> but, folks, you have to pay taxes on your car in Connecticut. Not, I'm not talking about to register your plates, but you have to pay anywhere, depending on what your car is valued, $500 to about $2,000 extra just to drive in that state every year. So it's a lot of taxes. But Connecticut and New England is beautiful, especially in the fall when the, you know, the, the leaves are turning on the trees. People have been nice there to me. Uh, ESPN is a big major employer, so when people learn you work for ESPN, you get treated with respect. My daughter, whose AAU team I told you about, I coached, uh, well, I coached for 22 years, but I coached her team in Dallas when I was a sports editor of the Dallas Morning News. She is now uh, assistant athletic director at Yale University, has nothing to do with me and she's the director of uh, athletic compliance there. And it's all because she grew up an athlete. So Yale's been very good to my family and, and me. Or not Yale, but Connecticut. How tall was, um, did you say his name was Chance? My son? Yeah. Nick. How tall he, Nick, my bad. How tall did he like, uh, yeah. How well, tall he's 5'10", he? but he thinks he's six, six feet. He, he, he's 5'10". <laughs> but, but he's a shooter, so, and, and a good player. Uh, do you play basketball? Okay, one more question. Hi, um, my name's Alex. I'm from London originally, in the UK. Hi. Um, how long did it take you from Dayton to get to ESPN? Uh, I left Dayton in 2000, and I went to Dallas where I ran Dallas Cowboys football coverage. Uh, down there for five or six years, and then I made it to ESPN in 2006, so six years. How you doing, sir? Good for you to be here and good for you to represent Cleveland. Two quick questions. Um, one, there's a number of students here from MC Squared STEM, which is a school 
on the campus of CSU. Uh, we all know that reading and writing are essential to success. Are there any tips that you have as a writer that you can uh, express to our young people in this, in this room? And then I have one more question. Sure, I mean, it depends on what writing you're, what type of writing you're doing. Expository writing, persuasive writing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm a storyteller. And if you watch, and I encourage you all to watch the E60 show if it's Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock. Uh, and look at the stories we're, we've done. Look at the story we're going to do on Isaiah Thomas. Look at the story we went back and did on Darko Milicic. Um, so because in 2003, it was LeBron, number one pick, Carmelo, number three, I think Bosch, four, and Wade, five. Darko was number two. We went and, and, you know, he wasn't a very successful player, but we went to Serbia and found him and did a whole story. So we're doing interesting stories. But the number one thing I find out in writing is, you know, expository writing might be a little different, but write about people. Write about, like, when I'm telling you this story here, I didn't just come in and say, oh, well, this is what being a man is about. I tried to tell you about Queenie, Fat, Aunt Mo, Bill. You, you write by telling stories. You get your point, you make your point, but then you illustrate your point by telling stories about people. Because people don't want to read about your point. They want to read about people. If you tell stories that's based on people, and we call it character development, and you know, um, I mean, I love this stuff. I could talk about that forever. But try to write about people, and then make sure, here's the other thing. And this isn't only about writing, this is in life. Remember, chance favors the prepared man. Whatever your point is, learn to make it in 30 seconds. Because if Barack Obama walked in here today and you had something you needed to say, you might only get 30 seconds with them. And you want to make that point. So we call it the elevator speech. Mm -hmm. If you get on the elevator with somebody, say with LeBron tomorrow, he's trapped with you on that elevator until it gets up to the top. What would you say to him? from floor one to floor six. That's your elevator speech. And whenever you're writing, think about what your elevator speech is or what your nut graph is. That's the point you're trying to make. And then illustrate it with stories about people. And nice segue for my second question, stories about people. You were here um, when I was a young kid, a teenager. So do you have any stories when you were writing at the Cauldron in 87? Because I know that's when Ken McFadden and the AMQ8, and that's when Cleveland State was really doing their thing yeah, um, in the tournament. Do you have any stories about those old days? Yeah, I'll tell you one quick story. So for those of you who don't know, Cleveland State was the first 14 seed to ever win a game in the NCAA tournament. They talk about Cinderella team. The original Cinderella team is, are the Cleveland State Vikings. And I covered them as a student here, and I remember – they went to the Sweet 16. And I remember during lunch, I would go over to the gym and play pick a ball. And Manute Bowl would be in there. You know Manute Bowl, seven foot. And his son, his son is nice now. He's lit. His son, and he's going to be in the NBA probably within the next two or three years. So Manute Bowl would be in there. And we'd play pickup because I would like to try to be the captain. they say, who are you picking first? I'm like, give me that guy. So we go to the NCAA tournament, and, and Cleveland State beats Indiana. We're in Syracuse, New York, in the first round. And then they beat St. Joe's of Pennsylvania in the second round. And the third round was the next weekend. They were going to have to play Navy and David Robinson, the admiral, the admiral. So all the press is around the coach, who's a friend of mine to this day, Kevin Mackey, another recovering addict. And he's a friend of mine. I did a story on him on ESPN about three years ago. So all the press, the major national press, and remember, I'm just really a student out of East Cleveland. They're around Mackey. So I said, coach, coach, trying to get my question in. So he knew me. He said, yeah, Dwayne. You know, now I'm like, I got the stage. I'm like, you guys have won two games in the NCAA tournament, and you could go far, but where would you be? If you had Manute Bowl at the back of that press, and without missing a beat, he looked at me, he said, on probation. <laughs> so those were the days, and those were the type of stories we had. Yes? How you doing again? Uh, hey. Thank you for coming to Cleveland. Uh, it's very appreciative to see somebody 
make an entire arc, you know, from East Cleveland, and to do that, not many people do that. Um, but question, I have this, uh, this optimism about myself, about what Cleveland could possibly be, um, but there's this emphasis on leaving Cleveland in order to be great. Would you have any suggestions on possibly how to, instead of us leaving Cleveland to become great, how do we bring greatness and empower greatness within Cleveland? I would say that you have a much better chance than people my age had, even though I ended up leaving Cleveland. Remember, I didn't want to leave Cleveland. They kicked me out because the, the only vehicle I had was to work for the plane dealer, and they told me to go and you know find work elsewhere. Here, I think with technology, technology allows you to do anything you want to do wherever you're at. And let me, I'm going to digress a little, because people saying, well, LeBron might go to L.A. Okay, he might. He might just want it. He has a house in Brentwood, I understand. But LeBron doesn't need to go to L.A. You know why? Because the money in basketball is in sneakers. And the money in sneakers is not even in this country. It's in Asia. It's in China. And the Chinese don't care if you're in Cleveland or L.A. or New York. They really don't. So I really think you know, depending on what you want to do, what type of business you want to get in, if you want to own your own business. I think you can do anything from Cleveland, Ohio. We were talking at lunch today about Warren Buffett, one of the richest men in the world, right? I got three of, my, uh, of our employees who live in Omaha, Nebraska, including Brian Windhorst, who was with the plane dealer, and uh, I'm working on a story with Brian now, and who now lives in Omaha. So you can be in Omaha, you can be in Cleveland, you don't have to be in Atlanta or DC or LA because technology allows you to do anything from anywhere. Please join me in thanking Dwayne Brain one more time. <laughs>